And now please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, every third Sunday in Advent, we get this wonderful text in which Mary celebrates the good news that she will bear a son. And it's not just any son, but the son of God. And this is not like she had just gone to the local pharmacy to get a pregnancy test either. Uh, the angel Gabriel himself had come to Mary to bring her the good news. Now, this is wild, crazy, amazing. And the ecstatic song that she sings, known to us by its Latin opening, Magnificat, echoes the song that Hannah sings in 1 Samuel when she receives the good news that she herself is pregnant. Traditionally, the third Sunday of Advent, as I mentioned before, is the Sunday of joy. We light the pink candle on the Advent wreath to symbolize this joy. And I can't think of a better text to exhibit joy than the text we have for this morning, the great Magnificat. The many wonderful musical sitting, settings of this day only help us to, well, magnify the joy of this particular liturgical day. And yet, there's something curious, at least curious for Protestants, about this day. We have this great joy when we celebrate the good news of Mary and the birth of Jesus. Mary takes center stage and then, then we just forget about Mary. Mary disappears, more or less, for the rest of the Christian year. She takes center stage on the third Sunday of Advent and then poof, no more Mary until next December. Has it ever struck you as odd? I mean, we have Mary and then no Mary. <laughs> the absence of Mary, of course, is in striking uh, contrast to what we see in the Roman Catholic tradition. In the Roman Catholic tradition, Mary takes center stage, or just next to center. She's referred to not just as Mary, but as the BVM, the Blessed Virgin Mary. She is the perpetual virgin. In the Catholic tradition, even after giving birth, her hymen was intact. And there are even stories circulating in the early Christian tradition to defend this somewhat unusual miracle. Moreover, since Mary carried the Son of God, Catholics have reasoned that she must have been without sin. That belief led to the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception, which we just celebrated this past week, or Catholics celebrated this past week. Mary's birth, like Jesus's, had to have been a miracle for her to have lived a sinless life and to have had the honor of carrying the Son of God. Similarly, Mary never died, or at least died in the traditional sense. She was taken up into heaven, the so-called Assumption of Mary. Furthermore, Mary has a unique place in heaven. When you, when you pray directly to her, she can make intercessions on your behalf to God. She can lean over and say, hey God, Jeff would really like you to know that, dot, dot, dot. There's an entire devotional life in the Catholic tradition dedicated to Mary. Its central feature, of course, being the rosary, and the principal words of which are the Hail Mary that come from the Gospel of Luke. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed be the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, and now at the hour of our death. Amen. Even me as a Protestant knows that. <laughs> and it's because of this traditional Marian, it's because of this Marian de devotion uh, that traditionally in the Catholic tradition, virginity uh, is praised in regards to women. Women should be pure. Women should be faithful and devoted to God and to the men in their lives. Looking to Mary as an example, women should, endu women should endure suffering. And but by faithful endurance, that will lead them to redemption. Now, since the Reformation, Protestants have rejected nearly all the theology that has grown up around Mary. Protestants reject the intercession of the saints. You can pray directly to God. There's no need to pray to Mary or any other saint that will not bring you any added benefit. The Bible states clearly that Jesus had siblings. So the notion of Mary as the perpetual virgin makes little sense to Protestants. Perpetual virginity, that doctrine needlessly elevates celibacy, something that Protestants have never liked. Moreover, the Immaculate Conception and the Assumption of, of, of Mary are patently unbiblical. So given the, and, and given the intense emotions around the Reformation, given how intensely the Reformation divided people, there's this notion among Protestants that anything that has to do with Mary is just too Catholic. Moreover, the feminists uh, have been particularly vehement in their rejection of the Roman Catholic traditions around Mary. The image of the submissive virgin who finds her value through pregnancy and suffering as a woman does not define faithfulness for feminists, to say the least. And yet, despite all these criticisms, these valid criticisms from the Protestant side anyway, I do have to wonder, especially on a Sunday like this one, 
if we're missing something in our wholesale Protestant rejection of Mary? Should we really dismiss everything about Mary? What should we do with her? Is there a way to recover or reframe our thinking about Mary? Now, to help me in this task this past week, I did something revolutionary, for me anyway. I turned to my bookshelf. <laughs> I've joked, with, Lynette, I've joked with, with Lynette that my book collection is aspirational. I have lots of books that I have not read, but I have them so that one day, one day, I will look at my shelf and think, now is the time. This is why I held on to you, my precious. And since the remainder of my books are getting packed up this week, I better take advantage of my library while I can. And so the book I turn to this week uh, is Eliz uh, Elizabeth Schussler Fiorenza's In Memory of Her, written back in 1983. Schussler Fiorenza is a New Testament scholar who was renowned for her work on feminist biblical studies. In Memory of Her is one of her best known books, and it looks at the origins of Christianity from a feminist perspective. What a, what a great book for the reconsideration of Mary. Now, hopefully you can humor me for a few moments while I introduce you to this fascinating work. Again, I'm taking advantage of this as long as I can. <laughs> Schussler Fiorenza claims that there are really two distinct Christian movements that we see in the New Testament. There is the Jesus movement that we find in the Gospels, one that focuses on the life and ministry of Jesus. And then, of course, you have the Christian missionary movement exemplified by the Apostle Paul, that focuses primarily on the death of Jesus and its implications, both for Jews and Gentiles alike. Surprisingly, of course, these letters have relatively little regard for the life and ministry of Jesus. Now, and I think Schussler Sh Fiorenza is fundamentally right in this characterization of these two movements within the New Testament. So what do we make of them? Well, the Jesus movement that we find in the Gospels was one, of course, of many reform movements within Judaism at the time. The first century was a time of great upheaval within Judaism. There was this sense among many Jews in Palestine that change was needed, that change was coming. The question was, what would that change be like? What would it look like? And there were different groups with different responses. You had, of course, the Sadducees, the establishment party. They focused on the observance of the Torah and proper worship in the temple in Jerusalem. Uh, if Jews could double down on that, then God would turn them into the people that God wanted them to be. You had the Zealots who believed with others that the Jews were the chosen people, and they, but they needed their independence from Rome in order to live into this covenant between God and Israel. They looked for a Messiah who would be a military leader in the model of King David. They were revolutionaries who espoused violence like the Maccabees before them. Then you had the Essenes. The Essenes separated themselves from society and obsessed over ritual purity. They would be the stump out of which would grow the new Israel once God came in judgment to clear the rest away. The Pharisees, the Pharisees were also a reform movement. They were outside the temple establishment and focused on the observance of both the written and the oral traditions of the Torah that were handed down to them. Got good Jews needed to observe the commandments and keep separate from the impure around them. And then of course you also have John the Baptist. John the Baptist who was an apocalyptic prophet calling on people to repent and prepare for the coming kingdom of God. Schussler Fiorenza asserts that Jesus was initially a follower of John the Baptist, which makes sense biblically, of course, but then after his time in the wilderness, he came to new insights about the faith. Unlike John, he preached that the kingdom that Basileia in Greek was arriving. It was already here. It was among us, and it had already begun. What's more, the locus of God's actions was not the temple in Jerusalem, but in the people themselves, who are the true temple of God. Since we're living in this Basilea time, since we're living in this kingdom moment, we must include all of God's people in this new age. Jesus' ministry was, therefore, at its core, a ministry of radical inclusion. That's what separated his from the other reform movements of the time. Everyone was welcome at his table, particularly those whom society had left behind. Again and again in the gospel, Jesus runs into conflict with other Jews because of his radical inclusion and because of his insistence that Torah obligations must be subordinated to service of the temple, which is, of course, the true temple of the people. This radical inclusion included women who at the time were so often neglected as second class citizens in their society. Jesus hung out with women and treated them as equals, even those who were not Jews. He healed women again and again, even women who were not Jews. His ministry lifted up the poor, and there was no segment of society 
that tended to be poor more than those who were women. Because the Gospels were written by men from a patriarchal perspective, we only get glimpses of how women were a central part of his ministry. It's easy when you look through the Gospels to think that it was just like Jesus and 12 dudes. But when you read the text with what Schussler Fiorenza calls a hermeneutic of suspicion, a lens that looks for suppressed voices, you see a different story. You realize that people like Mary Magdalene and the other women, they were there the whole time. Radical inclusion was at the core of his ministry. Then Schussler Fiorenza turns to the Christian missionary movement that emerged after Jesus' death. The key figure of this movement, of course, was the Apostle Paul. Now, the Apostle Paul, it must be said, has long been someone that feminists have not liked. <laughs> Parts of his letters have been used to oppress women for 2,000 years. But Schussler Fiorenza points out that Paul is only one member of this Christian missionary movement. And he came on the scene long after this Christian missionary movement had been inaugurated. Paul was a gifted writer and leader, for sure, but there's far more to this missionary movement than just Paul. Schussler Fiorenza argues that the Christian missionary movement had its start in the split between the Hellenists and the Hebrews in Acts 6. This is where I'm going to test those of you who, are the, who grew up Baptists and are the good Bible people. Had to start in the split between the Hellenists and the Hebrews in Acts 6. That split had to do with the Hellenists complaining that their widows were being neglected in the daily ministry, if you recall. Usually this is interpreted that the Hebrews were not giving alms to the Hellenist women. Yet Schussler Fiorenza points out that it very well could be that the Hebrews were denying women participation in, the, in communion, as in terms, that's what the serving ministry meant. Denying women participation in communion and full participation in the work and life of the church. That could have been the issue. And this split led to the Hellenists starting their own missionary work. So according to Schussler Fiorenza, it very well could be that the origin of the Christian missionary movement was a frustration that the Hebrews were not including their women as leaders. Schussler Fiorenza then points out that in spite of the patriarchal perspective of Acts and the letters of Paul, he points out, she points out how prominent a role that women played in this Christian missionary movement. They hosted house churches. They served as missionaries and teachers. One of Paul's leading opponents, Apollos, of course is always seen in a negative light, but Schussler Fiorenza points out that one of the things that Apollos was a likely proponent of was this wisdom or Sophia theology, which has feminine imagery at its core. Moreover, the Christian missionary movement was one that emphasized the role of the spirit and the new creation that emerges from a life in the spirit. The spirit broke down barriers that existed before and leads to something new. Of course, we have then also the famous lines of Paul from the letter to Galatians. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or, or free. There is no longer male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Again and again, Schuster Fiorenza shows that the theology and life of the early church laid the groundwork for the full inclusion of women. All of this brings me back to the Magnificat and our reading for this morning. There is this great tradition of feminism in the early church that Schuster Fiorenza lifts up. It goes back to the very beginning, to Jesus himself. But where did it start? Look at our reading for this morning in the first chapter of Luke's Gospel. Here in our text, the central figure is a woman, Mary. And Mary sings, surely from now on all generations will call me blessed, for the mighty one has done great things for me and holy is his name. The main emphasis in her moving song beyond extolling the great favor that's been shown to her is her framing of the nature of God's justice. This is something that's often missed when you read the Magnificat. It's actually quite a radical song. God brings down the proud and haughty and lifts up the poor. God shows favor to Israel, to all the people of Israel who are descendants of Abraham. As Schuster Fiorenza points out, the central theme of Jesus' ministry was that the kingdom of God is here, that God's justice is arriving. At the core of that message of justice is that the new temple is the people of Israel, all the descendants of Abraham. Jesus welcomes all to his table of radical inclusion, particularly those who are downtrodden. And this is precisely the message that we find here in the Magnificat. This is what Mary is singing about even before Jesus is born. And one could make the argument that the seeds of Jesus' later ministry, at least according to Luke, are planted by his mother, Mary. And of course, this makes perfect sense. Mary raised Jesus. She taught him the faith as she understood it. That's what mothers do. According to custom, Jesus lived with his mother until he decided to go to see John the Baptist by the River Jordan. No doubt, 
Mary was there encouraging her son in her calling, fully aware of how special he was. Then, as Jesus was in the wilderness discerning his future calling, the teachings of his mother would have come back to him and would have helped him revise John the Baptist teaching into the message that shaped his life. In addition, what's one of the few stories? Here's another thing for those biblical nerds out there. What's one of the few stories in the Gospels where we have Mary, the mother of Jesus, as a central figure? Uh, it's that Mary is present at the famous wedding at Cana uh, in John chapter 2. It is Mary who tells the stewards to do as her son commands. What is the central message of this first miracle at Cana? That the kingdom of God of Jesus is at hand. That's the message. That we are living in this banquet time. And there's more than enough good wine, the good blessings of life for all people. Mary is there. She starts that. As I mentioned earlier, the Christian missionary movement, as described by Schuster Fiorenza, is one that focuses on the life of the spirit and how that ecstatic experience breaks down barriers and starts a new creation. Here in the Magnificat, Mary has her own ecstatic experience of the spirit. She was quite literally about to give birth to the new creation, i.e. Jesus. And after Jesus' death, Mary was around. She was there in the early church. Jesus' mother surely influenced early Christian leaders in Jerusalem. After all, her other son, James, was the leader of the Jerusalem church. And perhaps Mary had far more influence than we realize. Maybe she was a driving force behind breaking down barriers and lifting up women as leaders in whom she saw the Spirit. This is conjecture, but it's conjecture that makes sense to me. Here is why this is so important. In the Roman Catholic tradition, Mary has been seen as the prototypical ideal woman. According to that Catholic tradition, Mary is faithful, long-suffering, virginal, obedient. She knows her place, as women should. But what if that is a misreading of Mary and her influence? What if that was more the result of a later patriarchal tradition and not the result of the historical Mary? We could very well see Mary in a much different light. Here is Mary, the woman favored by God and chosen by God. Here is Mary, the person who taught her son, Jesus, the truth of God's revelation and planted the seeds of the radical message of inclusion and love. Here is Mary, the woman who received the spirit that broke down barriers and gave birth to a new creation. Here is Mary, the woman who mentored scores of women who would serve as missionaries to the broader world. Imagine how impactful that message could be, should be, for the girls and women of this congregation. They might talk to their peers in their high schools who go to more conservative churches and who soak up the patriarchal message of those churches. They can tell their female peers a different message of the faith rooted in the Bible that, the, that lifts up the power and agency of women. They can see themselves as, as integral parts of the church, leaders of various ministries in God's name, following in the footsteps of Mary and in the footsteps of the other Marys and Prisca and Lydia and Phoebe, just to name a few. And even more important, these young, these young women in our congregation can all look around and see the, see, see the examples of the amazing, powerful women who are leaders here at FCC. The reality is that women have formed the backbone of the church since the earliest days, and certainly in American Protestantism in the last 200 years. It was women, church women, who led the Seneca Falls Convention and the first women's rights movement in this country. Women were behind every reform movement in society that the church led, from abolition to prohibition to the civil rights movement. It was women like Jane Addams who led the settlement house movement and the efforts to alleviate poverty and, uh, and the ill effects of early industrialization. Women were at the core of the Protestant foreign missionary movement in the 19th century, both at home and abroad. What is so sad is that the patriarchal traditions of the Bible and Christian theology have been allowed to overshadow the actual place of women in the Christian movement. And it doesn't have to be that way. Mary can show a way forward. Now this Advent, I've talked a lot about the Yale School of Theology. <laughs> if you've listened to the sermons in the past two weeks, you've heard how narrative is the central defining aspect of the Yale School of Theology. I have talked about how for too long, people were obsessed with whether everything in the Bible happened as it was described. But the Yale School claims that the more important thing is how the narrative of faith shapes us as moral people and molds us into a new creation. This morning I've tried to show how and why this matters concerning Mary. There are different narratives that we can tell about Mary. The traditional Roman Catholic narrative and the feminist narrative both have their roots in the Bible. 
question is, what story are we going to tell? What story we tell and how we tell it has a huge impact on us as Christians. Every Advent we tell the story of Jesus and his birth. And I hope that on the third Sunday of Advent we can also tell the story of Mary. Mary, the young woman chosen by God to nurture and church Jesus, the true path of inclusion. Mary, the woman who received revelation from God that helped inspire other women to be leaders. Mary, the woman who could boldly sing out in joy and whose words have echoed down through history to us today. There truly was something about Mary. So let's tell that story. Let's tell that story and see where the women will lead us next. After all, that's what women have been doing ever since the time of Mary.